So last week, we, we asked an important question. We said, why did God choose Mary? And obviously, she was chosen for a reason, and we talked about uh, those reasons that, that God had for selecting her, because there were a lot of young virgin women in Israel at the time, and including who would have descended from the line of David, which was necessary to fulfill prophecy. Well, today, we're asking a different important question. Okay, we, we, Joseph's been ignored for too long, right? Why did God choose Joseph? And we're going to find some really important and interesting things there as well. And so before we dig in, I want you to hold up your Bible or your tablet or your phone, whatever you get your scripture on, and read this with me, please. Is it up there? This is my Bible. It is the Word of God. In this book are the keys to an abundant life, a joy-filled life, and eternal life. I will take God at His Word. Amen. And you know, we, we want to say it and mean it. I'll take God at His Word. And we're going to be in Matthew chapter 1, starting with verse 18. So that's, that's right where we are. And it begins, This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. Now, why did God choose Joseph to be the adoptive father of God's son? Well, the Word of God says Joseph was a righteous man. That, that's dikaios is, is the word in Greek. I, imagine Joseph receiving this news from Mary. Now, he knew the baby wasn't his, but, but notice this. Joseph was already concerned about doing what was right before God spoke to him. When he got that news, he's already thinking about how do I do what's right here before God ever spoke to him. You know, he just gotten this life-altering news from Mary. She's pregnant. Undoubtedly, she told him that God himself was, was responsible for the pregnancy. Uh, that had to be mind-boggling. And, and whether or not he believed it, and I think that he did believe it, um, whether or not, I mean, he didn't fly into a rage against God or cast Mary by the side of the road because everything changed for him in that moment. Well, why not? Well, because he was righteous. The, the prophet Habakkuk first wrote, the righteous shall live by faith. You know, there's, there, there's a scripture that's very often quoted, there's no one righteous, not one. Well, that's talking about the ability of the things we do to get us into heaven. And no, the, the, from that standpoint, no, nobody's righteous. But there is a righteousness that comes by faith that is credited to a man or woman because of your faith. And God calls many of those servants of his in Scripture righteous. Joseph is one of them. And he didn't respond, okay, uh, the, the way that he felt because he was righteous. And, and of course, faith is proven, righteousness is proven, both by what you do and by what you don't do. A righteous heart doesn't hold a grudge. You holding a grudge against anyone? Is somebody on your list? A, a righteous heart doesn't hold a grudge. Is your heart hard towards somebody? Right now the Holy Spirit's reminding you who. A righteous heart doesn't dream about or seek revenge. Years ago, when I was crew handing on a on a 32 foot drift boat out in Bristol Bay, there was just a, a few of us on the boat, and this other guy I barely knew him, and he chose me to mock and persecute. I was a brand new Christian, and and I'll tell you, I came out of a a, a life of brawling. It, it was everything I could do to not physically light into this guy but it bothered me so bad that when the season ended and I come back home weeks later I'm still daydreaming about what I'd like to do to that guy but you know the Holy Spirit wasn't having any of that and the Lord convicted me about that and the Holy Spirit said to me how, how miserable do you think that guy would have to be to treat another person that way you need to pray for him 
Well, I didn't feel like praying for him, but I knew I was supposed to pray for him. And so I put him down in my prayer journal and I began praying God's blessing on him every single day and praying for God to save him. I'll tell you something, he, you know, it didn't happen overnight, but God changed my heart. And in the next few years, I don't know exactly when he did get saved. And I had an opportunity to meet with him down the, uh, further down the road and had just a beautiful conversation with him. And all of that old animosity and all those old feelings were gone. A righteous heart doesn't dream about or seek revenge. A righteous heart doesn't keep a record of wrongs. Do you have that list, that person who pushes your button? Oh, no, it's not just this. No, that's not all they did. They did this. No, you think that's it? Oh, no, we can go further back than that, can't we? Thank you, Jesus, that he doesn't keep that record of wrongs for us. When he forgives us, he chooses to forget, to cast it as far as the east is from the west. And we know he didn't say from the north, from the south, because you can only go north a certain distance and then you're going south again. But east, you just keep going forever. And west, you just keep going forever. And that's how far he casts it away. He chooses to do that, right? He doesn't keep, love keeps no record of wrongs. I had a person come to me one time, four pages, small script, no spaces, a, a record that they brought to me of my wrongs because they loved me. So they kept a record that they brought. There was not one thing in four pages, not one that was accurate or true. And the Holy Spirit said to me, don't respond to any of it. All garbage, don't respond to any of it. They finished going through their record because they loved me of my wrongs. And I said... I know I'm, because it's true, I know I'm so far from being a perfect pastor. I want to ask you to forgive me. Will you forgive me? A righteous heart doesn't keep a record of wrongs. Let it go. Okay, let it go. A righteous heart is willing to walk away from being hurt or wronged or betrayed without retaliating. Okay, when somebody's hurting you, when you're in the middle of the heat... Are you the one that's going to go wound for wound? Verbal piercing word for piercing word? Or even trying to get on top? You hurt me this much, I'll hurt you this much? Not a righteous heart. A righteous heart looks with love upon the one who is doing the wounding, just as Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. You know, from the standpoint of the flesh, the one who's wounding you or who wounded you may know very well exactly what they were doing, but spiritually they have no idea. They have no idea that that sinful harming of you was under the spirit of Satan himself the spirit of the Antichrist, and does damage to their own soul, and they don't know. Stephen, young man, probably in his 20s, when he was martyred, walking Bible almanac, knew the history of his people, spelled it all out for the religious leaders, and then called them out, rebuked them for killing the Messiah. And how did they respond to that? They pick up stones, and they're crushing him to death, murdering him with rocks. And from his knees, he said, Father, don't hold this sin against them. See, he could see what they couldn't see. Are you willing to look with love on that person rather than retaliating and just walk away? A righteous heart wishes only the best for the one who wounded you. You know, Jesus is very clear. We pray for those who persecute us. We bless those who mistreat us and spitefully use us. Bless and do not curse. Do you pray for God to bless the one who hurt you most? Because I want to tell you, if you pray God's best for that person, you know what God's best is? God's best for that person is that they would come into a radical, life-changing encounter with Jesus Christ, and they would be a completely new person. And you know what's going to happen if that happens? It's going to change your relationship with them. Because it's not going to be them. It's going to be someone new who now loves Jesus. It's going to be now a brother or sister in the Lord. Everything's going to change. You pray that for them. You pray God's best for the one who wounded you. That's what a righteous heart does. See, righteousness is always stronger than emotions. Emotions are so strong. Righteousness is stronger. 
This would allow Job to say at the, at the loss of all ten children in a day in a single catastrophic event, the loss of most of his wealth, his physical health, I mean, gruesome, ugly pain and suffering. And he said, naked I came into the world and naked I will depart. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Righteousness is stronger than how you feel. Are you willing to do the right thing, to respond the right way? Well, Joseph, God says, was a righteous man. What else do we see? Verse 20, after he had considered this, divorcing her quietly, after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife, but he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son. Now, again, the fact that Joseph decided to divorce her quietly, it shows his concern for Mary even in the light of what he knew other people were going to say that she'd been unfaithful. And even in the light of that, he's got this concern for her, right? He, he wished her no harm, but again, righteousness goes further than that. He tried to protect Mary. He, he refused to simply abandon her, even though his heart had to be very shaken uh, by this news. But, but let's back up even one more step from there. The Bible says that he had in mind to divorce her quietly, but after he had considered this, See, the, what, what that tells us, it, it shows us that upon hearing the news of her pregnancy, before acting, he stopped to consider how to respond. Now, what was the advantage of that? Well, it gave God time to speak. See, how, how often do we just have a knee-jerk reaction to something that is unwanted or unpleasant or unkind, and we just go, whoom, Right? I mean, have you ever said anything you wish you wouldn't have said? You ever done anything you wish you wouldn't have done? See, but, but, but Joseph, as, as a righteous man, a righteous heart, considers before speaking or acting. Again, why? Because it gives God time to speak and gives us time to listen. You know, this is why our, uh, you know, maybe you taught your children, I know my grandmother, you know, count to ten. The problem was I could count to 10 so fast, 1, 3, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, then I could blow, right? So, yeah, I, I did what I was supposed to do, and then I blew. The, the deal is we want to consider. Stop to consider. You, you, you know, it, it gives your emotions time to calm. It gives us time to pray. When, when Joseph heard the news of Mary's pregnancy, now get this. He didn't say, I'm sorry, but I'm leaving you even though he was sorry and he was considering leaving her. He didn't say it because he was considering. And when he considered, God had a chance to speak. And what did God say to him? What he does with you and me, if we'll stop to consider, is very often what God's going to say is contrary to what we've been considering. And that, and that was true with him. So God, uh, you, you know, message, his message to Joseph was contrary to the plans Joseph was making, certainly contrary to his emotions and how he was feeling, yet once he heard from God, he obeyed. Just like that, right? The angel visited him in a dream. He knew it was an angel from God. He knew that it was real. And because the angel was God's messenger, that's what angel means, his messenger, then he knew the messenger delivered a message, and it was God's message being delivered. He took it as a message from God, and so he immediately obeyed. You know, it, it's amazing how often I hear from very sincere Jesus-loving people, and maybe this is going to resonate with some of you here, 
It's amazing how often I hear someone who really loves Jesus say, I just feel like God never speaks to me. I, I hear people say how God speaks to them, and, and I wonder, why, why doesn't God speak to me? Well, if, if that's you, here's what I would say to that. If you aren't hearing from God, check your obedience. This is the place to start. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2, God said, Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear. But your depravity has separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you. You get it? Your, your sins have hidden his face from you. His arm's not too short to save. But there's a problem, and you're the one who's erected the problem. It's as though God is saying to us when we're living like that, and I've been there. And it's as though God is saying to us, I'm not speaking to you because you don't listen to me. Right? If we've got sin in our life, if we've got an area of disobedience in our life, you say, well, I'm, you know, God just never speaks to me. Well, maybe it's because you've had the same sin going on year after year after year after year. God's waiting to speak, wanting to speak. If you aren't hearing, check your obedience, right? And you, you go back to your point of disobedience. And some of you, the Holy Spirit's showing you what that is right now. You already know what your point of disobedience is. Some of you, you have to say, well, Lord, show me. If there's, a, if there's something, Father, in my life, show me. And the Holy Spirit will. You go back to your point of disobedience. You repent and you obey. All right? And then, I want to tell you something. You're going to start hearing from the Lord. You will, you will, you will. Suddenly, the Word will become alive again. Suddenly, the Holy Spirit will be speaking to you as you go about your business in ways. And then you're going to be one of those people who talks about how God speaks to you. And someone else is going to say, why doesn't God ever speak to me? Right? Go back to that point of disobedience, repent and obey. So Joseph wakes up, he takes Mary home as his wife. This is an expedited wedding, right, in obedience to God. But notice also that he had no union with her until after the child was born. Now, now guys, I, I'm just going to touch this briefly, but the church is so desperately in need right now of, of discipline in the area of sexual purity. And Joseph, even though he had the right he had the opportunity. He clearly would have had strong levels of temptation, okay, for, for intimacy with, with his wife. And yet, he, he practiced discipline here. He had no union with her. You can, you can stay sexually pure. And, and Joseph, though his righteousness here, once again, is put to the test, he maintained it. He disciplined his desires, which means that he brought the desires of his flesh under the, under the authority of God, right? Under the control of the Holy Spirit in him, under the authority of the Word of God. And he did that not by emotion, let me tell you. Not if he was wired like every man I've ever known. He did that by faith, okay, by faith and by practicing discipline. So let's talk about the source of Joseph's spiritual strength because this is a man who was chosen by God because he was strong spiritually, just as Mary was as well. So what were the sources of his spiritual strength? Number one, obedience. Guys, again... When we look at disobedience, typically we think of sin. We, we think of somebody that's been, you know, watching things they shouldn't be watching or doing things they, they, they shouldn't be doing or using language they shouldn't be using or I took something that doesn't belong to me or I was intentionally unkind to someone. We think about all of those kinds of things. But I'll tell you, there's, God has all kinds of instructions for us that don't have to do with, with, with you morally sinning against him. For example, Jesus said, therefore go and make disciples of all nations. Well, that was to every one of us. That wasn't to the preachers and to the missionaries. That was to every follower of Jesus. So are you being obedient in other words, are you praying for lost people that you know and lost people that are far away that you've never met? 
Are you investing your resources helping to take the gospel to these faraway places as well as at home? Are you doing that because God's called you? And are you sharing your faith? Something that is easier today with our social media than it's ever been before for you to share your faith with other people. Well, if you're not, don't, don't, don't wonder why, why it seems like you never hear from God. Why would he have anything to say to you if you don't obey and it doesn't bother you to not obey? Again, it's as though the Lord would say, well, I don't speak to her because she doesn't listen to me. I don't speak to him. What good would it do? He doesn't listen to me. Right? We have to go back to that point. We have to repent. And we have to begin to obey. Boy, that's going to open those floodgates of communication between you, between your heart and his heart. That'll happen. Second source of his spiritual strength was discipline. Now, guys, any time that I have a sin problem, whether I'm talking about, you, you know, greed or lust or anger or just on and on and on, whatever it is, uh, if I boil that down, at the center of it, there's always the same thing at the center, self. Right? That's the song. It's all about me, Jesus. Yeah, that's not how it goes, is it? But that's the way we live it sometimes, isn't it? And I'm always at the self. Well, what is the answer to that? Self-discipline, right? We, we die to self. Well, that takes self-discipline to die to self by faith. Again, not by emotion, but, but, but discipline says what God says is first, what God says is true, and I'm going to follow, and I am going to discipline my life so that irrespective of my flesh and its desires, my mind, my dream, my goals, my personal desires, it's always going to be, yet not my will, Lord, but yours be done. Always that discipline coming first. So let's look at those again because you wonder, well, how do I get past that? A righteous heart that doesn't hold a grudge, okay? Uh, a righteous heart doesn't hold a grudge. What do you do? If you've been holding a grudge, you repent you ask God to forgive you. Ask the person to forgive you. A righteous heart doesn't dream about or seek revenge. What do you do? You repent if that's your problem. You repent. You ask God's forgiveness. Right? A righteous heart doesn't keep a record of wrongs. What do you do? You repent and you get rid of it and you don't bring it up again. Satan will always throw those things up. You don't have to receive them. Let them lay in on the street. He drags those things out of the grave. Let them lay dead on the ground. You don't have to pick them up. A righteous heart is willing to walk away from being hurt or wronged or betrayed without retaliating. Have you retaliated? Repent. That's the key. A righteous heart wishes only the best for the one who wounded you. You've not been doing that? Repent. A righteous heart considers before speaking or acting. You've not been pausing to consider. You say something you wish you wouldn't have said. You do something you wish you shouldn't have done. Repent. It's always the same solution. Righteousness is always stronger than emotions. If you're willing, right? Amen. If you're willing, get your life right and you'll start hearing from God. I'll guarantee it. Our story of Joseph continues with verse 25. And he gave him, the child, the name Jesus. He, Joseph, not Mary, gave him the name that is above every name, the name to which one day every knee will bow. And I'm going to read through. This is just a partial list. Every one of these has a scripture reference attached to it. That some of the names of Jesus. Listen to these beautiful names. He is Alpha and Omega, the author of life, our advocate, the Almighty, our all in all, and the ancient of days. He is the anointed one, the author of our salvation, the bread of life, the breath of life, the bridegroom, and the bright morning star. He is the chief shepherd, the chosen one, our comforter, cornerstone, counselor, and creator. He is the crown of beauty, a consuming fire. He is Christ the Lord. He is our deliverer and our dwelling place, Emmanuel, eternal life, faithful and true, the firstborn and the firstfruits. 
He is our fortress and foundation, the fountain of living water. He is a fragrant offering, friend of sinners, the God who sees me, and our great high priest. He is the head of the church, our hiding place, the Holy One of Israel, our hope, and the horn of our salvation. He is the great I Am, the good shepherd, righteous judge, king of glory, and king of kings. He is love, the Lamb of God, the light of men, the light of the world, and the lion of the tribe of Judah. He is our living water, Lord of peace, Lord of glory, Lord of the harvest, Lord of hosts, and Lord of lords. He is a man of sorrows, our maker, master, mediator, merciful God, and Messiah. He is the Nazarene, the offspring of David, the only begotten son, our Passover lamb, the great physician, our portion, and the prince of peace. He is the radiance of God's glory, our redeemer, our refuge, the righteous one, our rock, the root of David, and the ruler of God's creation. He is Savior, servant, the shepherd of our souls, our shield, the star out of Jacob, our strength and strong tower, the son of righteousness, the son of man, and the son of God. He is our teacher, the true witness and the true light. He is the vine, a wall of fire, the wisdom of God, the way, the truth, and the life. He is Jesus. Jesus, the name that is above every name. And at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. But is he your Lord? That's the question. Not is he the Lord. Is he your Lord? Is he your Savior? Not the Savior. Is he your Savior? Is he your King, your ruler, your authority? Do you know him? Revelation twenty two seventeen 17 says, The Spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him who hears say, Come. Whoever is thirsty, let him come. And whoever wishes, let him take the free gift of the water of life. The invitation is to come. The free gift, the water of life. If you believe that Jesus is the Messiah... And there's never been a time in your life when you have repented of your sins and asked him to forgive you and save you, literally to adopt you to be a child of God. That's what it means to become a Christian. Jesus said, you need to be born spiritually, born again. And if you believe he's the Messiah, if you have that faith, we want to give you an opportunity right here, right now, to pray this simple prayer of faith, surrendering your life to Him and receiving by faith the gift of forgiveness and eternal life. Just pray this simple prayer. We'll all bow our heads and pray along with you. Pray this simple prayer right where you're seated. Jesus, I do believe you're the Son of God. I believe you died on a cross to pay for my sins and the sins of the whole world, and I believe you rose again. I confess to you that I'm a sinner. I've done so many things that are wrong. I know that I'm guilty, Jesus. And I'm asking you, please forgive me. Right here, right now, I'm asking you, Jesus, to save me. To adopt me to be a child of God. Right now, right here, I'm surrendering my life to you. And by faith, because you promised, I'm receiving the gift of forgiveness and eternal life. Today I've become a Christian. Thank you for loving me and saving me. Thank you for being patient and waiting for me. Show me now how to live in a way that pleases you. 